Welcome back to Watch Us Live right here on Watchbox Reviews. Thank you for joining me from Far Flung. Tonight we have an incredible array of watches. There really is no theme except sheer variety. Remember, I will pay you for your views, in a manner of speaking. Click link in the description to win the Rolex 116400 GV Milgauss. I'm giving away a green crystal Milgauss with full boxes, full papers, and as I like to say, all it needs is your wrist. Click the link in the description and get to it, because I want a YouTuber to win this one. I believe in instant gratification, so I showed you a clickbait Rolex, and I'm getting right to the rivalry with Breitling. These are two very distinct takes on pilot watches. Of course, the Rolex GMT Master II BLNR, this is the, of course, uh, 2013 version of the watch. It's now on a Jubilee bracelet with a three-day power reserve. This is the discontinued version as of late. 40 millimeters stainless steel. The original model GMT Master came out in late 1954 and it was originally designed for Pan Am pilots. The idea being that the 24-hour hand would be set along with the time at center to Greenwich Mean Time and then you would use the local airport offset to judge the local time at your airport of destination. That was one take on the pilot's watch. That same year, though Breitling claims 1952, most folks believe that 1954 mid to late year was the debut of the Navitimer. And this is a total different take on the pilot's watch concept because it is a rotating bezel logarithmic scale flight calculator calibrated for aviation functions in tandem with a chronograph. Now the watch in my hand is the Navitimer B01 43 millimeters stainless steel and you can see it is the latest version post 2018 with the tone on tone dial. Georges Kern wants you to know that when you look at a modern Breitling watch with the logo sans wings, tone on tone means in-house caliber. And indeed the watch does feature an in-house caliber. I don't have quite the nails that I used to have because I manicured look good for those videos I filmed for you guys, but you can see that this also also features a display case back of that in-house caliber. Column wheel caliber, B01, three-day power reserve, COSC chronometer, vertical clutch, and a column wheel in tandem, 47 joules. The watch features the same flight calculator as the original Navitimer. It gives you the ability to perform multiplication and division very rapidly. That's one take on a pilot's watch. One thing I want to show you is just how much better Breitling watches are getting. Under Georges Kern, you can see there is now a Rolex-style micrometric adjustment inside of the clasp. It has two adjustment notches and the clasp far more robust than in the past. It is still stamped, but it is a thick piece of metal. It doesn't feel like the tin foil it used to be. Navitimer 7-link bracelet, very comfortable. This is probably the most appealing Navitimer I've encountered in some time. Now, let's consider the Rolex rival. Okay, 40 millimeters is going to wear very different from 43, and the Navitimer is 30 meters water resistant. This is 100, so this is a full service sports watch and fully swimmable. The bezel, though not a calculator, can allow you on a GMT Master 2 to see not two, but three instantaneous time zones. Ceramic inlay, this one also has a little bit of a shielding against scratches and scuffs. And of course, I was talking about the Rolex EasyLink system. Well, this is the first and the original 5 millimeter of incremental adjustment inside of the clasp. This is what I was referring to when I showed you the Breitling. Breitling is just getting into this. Rolex has been doing it since 2005. Let me show you some wrist shots. Let's see who's joining in. Boom! Mr. Campbell Roberts joining us from London. Welcome aboard. I can see Derek P. from Los Angeles, Jeff M. from San Francisco. FAC man is saying classic Navitimer for me. Bear Clooney watches in the box as a 28. Edward Ledden from Sweden. I could see Jakob Kasper, BS, Christopher Gustafsson uh, from Portland, Oregon. Tom P., Portia Maven from Montreal up in French Canada. And Mark S. representing Brooklyn. Mr. Casper saying the Breitling is too busy unless you actually need the complications. This is true, but some people like that highly calibrated aviators and aesthetic. 40 millimeters super case wears a bit larger. It looks like a 42 or a 43 on the wrist. So in real life, these watches not altogether that different in wrist stance. Now let's take a look at the Navitimer. Bum, 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 bum. Oh, I gotta open this clasp again. It's very well made. It's just not for people short of nail. 
Now you can see the Breitling doesn't look bigger than the Rolex on the wrist. It looks about the same size. Breitling has pared down its lugs. They're now much more compact across the wrist. So these watches actually wear well on human wrists. Both big and blue. If I had to pick between the two, I'm going with the Breitling. I like the function of the calculator. I know how to use it. And the chronograph to me is quite useful if, like yours truly, you're timing this show so you don't go over time. A lovely piece. We should have a Speedmaster Moonwatch on the table, but alas, nobody's perfect. Jumping right in, I can see Luke is joining us from Lansdale, Pennsylvania. And Louis P., happy to catch us live, joining from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Rich Buddy from sunny California, and Andrew. Hi, Andrew. Hail Bop joining in, a customer and a friend. Boom, guys, if you're just joining in, click link in the description. Win that Rolex Milgauss. It's free, and it's our first international giveaway. Now, those are two steel sports watches, but I'm going to go at steel sports watches from a very different angle. I featured a few versions of the 2013 to present Carl F. Bucherer, Petravi Scuba Tech on the show, but this watch really underscores how versatile the reference is. You can see this white dial with the manta ray pattern across its face. 44.6 millimeters. It doesn't wear that large. It's 13.5 millimeters thick, so it's not thick objectively. It features a very chunky bezel action with a wonderful ceramic inlay and a COSC certified Salida SW200. So it's very precise. 500 meters, you can see there is a helium escape valve on the flank. And if you look at the side of this watch, you can see it is not an imposing chunk. It is quite slim. For the helium escape, the automatic winding, and the 500 meter depth, the crystal is four millimeters thick and thus both very resistant against water and very shatter resistant. Bezel action is excellent. Let's go to the mic. It's chunky, it's crisp, you can feel the detent, you can hear it, and I love this bracelet. If you want to talk bracelets, right now it's Rolex and it's Carl F. Bucherer. I know a bit of a surprise and an upset over the established powers from Breitling and Omega, but these guys are doing things right now. This is a slider incremental adjustment bracelet. You can see internally there's a push button and about... 10 millimeters of incremental adjustment, but if you go to the other side of the clasp, open up the opposite folding side, you can see there is a all or nothing pull out dive extension, so you actually get both. This watch is a phenomenal value. You get the incremental slider, the all or nothing, a COSC chronometer movement, helium escape valve, ceramic bezel, stainless steel, an underrated brand from a great house, Bucherer. Bucherer, the largest vendor of luxury watches in Europe. Their Carl F. Bucherer watch line is relatively young, established in 2001, but climb aboard because this is a brand that's going places. Jumping into the box, I can see Tobias L saying that is crispy, and BKR421 saying love me some bezel. Jan joining from Scotland, I appreciate that Jan, and I can see right here we have Mark S. Tim, any update on the sports watch bracelet feature? I just need to get them all together, I just got back from Watch Time LA with like four videos ready to go, so I was filming all day today and it was just bedrock, it was just watches for the next couple of days. When I get far enough ahead of my production that I can do videos just about bracelets, Mark, that's when I will get to the bracelet review and I promise you it will be worth the wait. Jumping right in from the box, I can see Justin Grimm jumping in and we've got Spilker's Compass joining us from Iceland. That's my first confirmed Iceland sighting. Thank you so much. Thomas Burnett saying that's a comfortable looking bracelet. It is as comfy as it looks. Now different ways to do a diver. How about no bracelet? 1966 serial, Tudor Submariner, 7928. Launched in 1959, the 7928 was Tudor's first Submariner dive watch with crown guards. The originals were highly squared off and shared with the early Rolex 5512. This is the more tapered later design. This is towards the end of production from about 66, 67. You can see the original Tudor Rose logo on the dial and the dial, a wonderful tritium patina. The dial is good, but not too good to be true. I like this. It's authentic. Authentic, it's believable. 200 meter case, 200 meter water resistance, a wonderful plexiglass, and these Submariners were 39 millimeters, so a bit more petite than current production. This was the end of pre ETA Tudor subs. This featured a Fleurier caliber 390, old school Tudor sub, and the real deal, too. Uh, before there was the Hydronaut and before there was the Pelagos and the Black Bay, up till 1999, there was the Tudor Submariner, a distinguished line of established in the 50s, extinguished in the 90s. This is a great example. Or, bump a bump, I could see W. Burton saying, love Tudor more than I love Rolex. Ted D. is joining us from Toronto, and we've got Edward Ledden joining in. Greeting, Alexi. 
who is from Finland, I believe. So we've got Sweden, Iceland, and Finland here. We're missing Denmark and Norway. So if you're from Denmark or Norway, shout out and represent. This is a watch I adore. And it's a big watch, but it's a wearable watch from a brand that I'm seriously thinking of making my new collection theme. As I re-enter watch collecting, I'm shopping for a brand to love. And Ulysse Norda of Le Loc is one you can love. This is a 500-piece limited edition from 2009, the Diver Perpetual, carbon fiber dial, titanium construction. You can see it features Ulysse Norda's quirky but brand distinctive combination of hinges and natural vulcanized rubber. It is a hinge bracelet strap hybrid. The links are titanium, the case is titanium, and as you can see, this is a perpetual calendar. Ulysse Norden fitting their distinctive Ludwig Oxlin designed perpetual calendar that allows you to set it bi-directionally forward and backward and at any time of the day without damage. This is a dive watch that I could really dig because let's face it, we mostly wear our dive watches in home, at the office, on jogs, at the beach, very rarely diving. And what do you need at the home and office? You need to know the date for memos, for letters, for correspondence, for emails, and a perpetual calendar is the king of date complications. Let me show you how this one works because it's an absolute pleasure. This was a 500 piece series that followed the earlier 42.7 millimeter aqua perpetual. This is super cool because you really can adjust the perpetual calendar in both directions with no hazard at all. And this is just the ultimate thrill after years of watching people take their watches to watchmakers to have perpetual calendars set because they're afraid of them. Set without fear, unidirectional rotating dive bezel with rubber inlays, and I found that these have aged quite well. It's a lovely piece that is 100% UN. This could not be a watch designed by any other brand. It's the image of a 19th century deck chronometer in the form of a 21st century dive watch, and I adore it. By the way, how much do you love the lacquer over the carbon of the dial? A slick piece that I really really dig. Jumping into the box, time is money, saying, love that UN, it's a killer. Tobias laughing and cackling, presumably I missed the joke. Dustin Van Patten saying, you lease Norden, they are super and underrated. Kenneth M., like the UN, you will not see that every day. Like UN, you will not see it every day. And we've got Suman Reddy joining us from Melbourne, Australia, getting up early with us. I can see Louis P. saying, definitely a fan of the nautical bent UN and some of the wild styles that emanate from that house, keeping us on our toes. Eric Nielsen saying, the Bucherer with an in-house movement would be demonstrably better than a sub or GMT master, but Salida, but Salida chronometer. There's no faking COSC. It either gets the certificate or it doesn't. You can't fake that hairspring. You can't fake that balance. You can't fake the five position regulation. Where Salita is concerned, I am cool when it's a chronometer. Speaking of chronometers, from the other side of the Swiss-German border, from Glasuta, released in 2016 with an explosive Forsheim manufactured lacquered and varnished granular blue dial. This is the Ulysse, or I should say Ulysse Norden, Glasuta Original Senator Observer Chronometer. This is a piece that is absolutely through the roof. Now, it is basically an observation or deck clock with the image of a marine chronometer on its dial, very similar to Ulysse Norden. The Senator Chronometer features the only example I've ever seen of a zero reset that aligns both seconds and minutes. Once you pull the crown, you enter that zero reset mode, and you can see that the watch adjusts in one minute increments, forward or backwards. It's actually a detent system that adjusts precisely aligned to the minute indices. I've never seen another watch that does this. 44 hour power reserve, caliber 5801, certified as chronometer in Germany by German standards as a fully cased up watch, not a bare movement as you see with the Swiss COSC. And the movement is worth your time to enjoy. You could see that spectacular spiral graining hand laid on one of the two ratchet wheels, two barrels for even torque release, freehand engraved half bridge, glossuta stripes, note the jewels of the train set in chaton and fixed with blued screws, engine turned prolage on the base plate. This is as good as it gets from the folks at Geo, a brand that's only making about 10,000 watches a year these days. It is basically the Swatch brand with the most potential, but the one which has been the most neglected. Geo, I'm really pulling for you guys. An absolutely monstrous 42 millimeter white gold watch. Let's throw this one on the wrist. This is the Senator Chronometer in white gold from 2016. A lacquered varnished granular dial that they make at their dial manufacturer in Forsheim. Lovely piece. Jumping into the box. 
we've got a lot of friends joining us. We're up to 185. Stay in the chat. My guys, I really appreciate you helping me with these view numbers. You make my job possible, and it is the world's best job. We've got Justin Grimm. Are you able to give price points when chatting about the watches? I can go to the price list. I have it, but I don't want it to be like a constant back and forth. I'll give you the geo just because you mentioned it. Looks like we're asking about 18,500, 19,000 for that one. Bum, 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 bum. Jumping back to the box. All right. UN, good prices secondhand, and Glossu de Riganal, great prices secondhand. We've got Hadi S joining us from Qatar. Thank you for staying up late with me. All right, let's jump to another German watches because we're on a kick. And this is the late, great double split platinum. Launched in 2004, the double split was the first ever chronograph that allows you to split both the minutes and the seconds. So, for example, you have one time interval that takes 27 minutes and 30 seconds, and another that takes 28 minutes and 14 seconds. The watch can display both. Power reserve scale at the top, the dial is made of solid silver with incredible depth from the Ray Hot down to the base, technically part of the Saxonia collection, a big boy, in platinum at 43.2 millimeters. This model was made from 2004 to 2011, so it is the discontinued platinum double split, an absolute beast on the wrist. Caliber L0011 on the case back, 40 joules, manual wind, twin column wheel, 38 hour power reserve. This thing is a monster. Look at the depth of that movement. Harrison, can you get a little bit closer even? I'll hold it steady. Look at the depth of that movement and every single piece, not just a piece of engineering, not just functional, but artisanally finished and double assembled. First, to assure the fit and operation. Second, lubricated and regulated. Very few brands do that. Longa, an example of how things are done right. The double split mechanism at its best. A movement to die for from a watch that is just as sharp. Silver dial galvanized black with a platinum case. What a beast. Yikes. I'm all about that. I can see... Alexander Berry is saying, this is luxury steampunk. And Mark S. Tim, how would a double split in steel sell? Back in 2008, Longa made a couple of them. And I want to say one auctioned in 2013. So search on Google, Longa double split steel 2013 auction, and you will see exactly how it would sell. They also made a couple for Japan that were yellow gold. Very rare, steel or yellow gold double splits. You don't see a whole lot, and when they show up, they're auction catalog cover watches. Let's go back to the Valet de Jeu and Holy Trinity Swiss Horology, but a watch we rarely see from a line that's almost unheard of on this show. We don't talk about the millinery enough. Launched in 1995 and designed by Royal Oak Offshore designer Emmanuel Get. the millinery was originally a rather timid 38 millimeters, upgraded in the 2000s to a more robust 45. That 45 is lengthwise across the wrist from nine o'clock to three o'clock. The watch is only 9.2 millimeters thick and 48 millimeters lug to lug, which means it wears well and easily. I adore this watch. 60 hour power reserve, in-house caliber AP3120. 40 joules, full balance bridge, gyromax style, free sprung balance, 22 carat freehand engraved rotor, featuring the coats of arms of the Audemars and Piguet family, to remind you that Audemars Piguet is still owned and run by founding family controllers. G-Series early, this was roughly 2008 production. You can see there's both a metallic satin grain to the dial with an outer and inner lacquer that is absolutely gorgeous in robin's egg blue. Look at the nuance of these lugs too. How gorgeous is that step and fluting? Beautiful watch and underrated. Jumping into the box, I can see David Gross, Alanga over Patek Philippe. We're in agreement. No contest. Hadi S saying, I love the baby blue. You and me both. And Barry BKT, that longa is stunning. Mason One saying, my preferred double split is the rose gold. Good news. Still available. All right. Jumping straight in. We have David Tanner asking, SKX next? No, the closest thing I've got is my Zin Easy M11. Let's show that. You guys know this watch, 500 pieces, 2017, 43 millimeters, tegumented stainless steel with Zin's own modification of a Valjeu 7750 called the SZ04. It is a center register 60 minute chronograph based on a design made in 1997 for the German Customs Enforcement Unit, the ZUZ. All right, jumping back to our regularly scheduled program, we're going on a small brand kick after Vacheron Constantin. I have a Vacheron that's basically gonna bring down the curtain on this episode. I can't top it. But first, 
launched in late 2017, a watch I originally did not love. This is the Triple Calendar 1942, 40 millimeters in stainless steel with exquisite corn de vache, cow horn lugs, and a triple gadron case. This is Art Deco high style and the high point of recent Vacheron production. You can see the dial, redolent of 1940s triple calendar watches, then powered by LeCoult calibers. Today, powered by a Vacheron in-house caliber 4400, manual wind Geneva Hallmark 65 hour power reserve. It's beautiful internally and externally, a watch that I would absolutely rock. And again, stainless steel. Boom, how much do you love the blue on silver date discs? for the day and the month. I love the radial indicator with the same blue on silver pointer style date track and its center, wonderful blued steel hands with a baton style. Absolutely gorgeous. This is as good as it gets from VC in the modern era. But I have a watch that may cause you to second guess. Now we talked about sports watch earlier. Let's talk about sports watches one more time. I don't often feature the overseas automatic from the generation three with the silver dial. It looks great. 41 millimeters silver dial white gold indices and hands that have been oxidized a sort of grayish anthracite. A lovely look. The watch nice and slim wears easily on my 16 centimeter circumference wrist. It's a real sports watch. 150 meters water resistant, 25,000 ampere per meter anti-magnetic. All of this and you get three bands when you buy it. You get a leather strap, you get a rubber strap, you get a separate steel deployment clasp for the straps and of course you get this bracelet all of them benefiting from Vacheron's quick release lug system that allows you to make changes without any resort to a strap tool. In-house caliber 5100 display case back. First in-house caliber in a VC overseas. First display case back in a VC overseas. You'll note the Geneva hallmark on both case and movement it is now a full watch standard, 60 hour power reserve and beautiful. This is a watch that's almost too much fun to dismantle because you can do it with just a fingernail. And check this out. The bracelet is fully sizable. Every link on both sides has a screw so you can remove every link. VC absolutely slaying with the current overseas. And I could see Tobias saying, that's the one. Alexandra saying, VC has a romantic decadent style. And I could see Edward Ledden saying, better than the blue dial, I must say. Interesting, interesting perspective, Tim. What is more scratch resistant, steel or titanium? Stainless steel, grade two titanium, and then grade five titanium. But if the if the steel or the titanium has been carbon diffused or treated like the Zin, then it could be on its surface much harder. The same is true with Damasco ice hardening. Zin is harder on the surface than Damasco, but Damasco's treatment goes all the way through the metal. So the Zin is more scratch resistant, the Damasco is more dent resistant. Remember, it's really the treatment of the material, not whether it's steel or titanium, that's gonna determine just how tough it is. All right. Jumping back, what should we talk about? Let's talk about Omega. Omega launching the Speedmaster Racing in 2017, 44.25 millimeters. It doesn't wear that large. This one with a wonderful granular gray dial with a matte finish. You can see rose gold indices. You can see the same 5N red gold, Sedna gold underneath the tack. Sarah gold, that is ceramic and gold for the tachymeter. The watch is actually easy to wear because it's 49.9 millimeters lug to lug. It doesn't feel like a 44 and a quarter on the wrist. An easy watch to wear 9900 caliber 60 hour power reserve twin barrel it is a Matos chronometer so a fully cased up eight test standard created by Omega and the Swiss Federal Institute of Metrology vertical clutch column wheel coaxial escapement the watch has been adjusted in six positions as a cased up watch not the bare movement five position test of the COSC a lovely piece and a great way to wear two-tone with a modern vibe to it this is a young treatment of two-tone this doesn't feel 80s it doesn't feel 90s and it's one of the best of the Speedmaster racings Look at that seconds track outboard. You have that staggered style sub seconds, or I should say fraction of a second read, that looks like a racing checkered flag, hence the nickname Racing Dial. Jumping back to the box, I can see Richard Cohn from sunny South Florida, a fan of the Gen 3 bezel, and he thinks the plinth on the Generation 3 overseas looks nice. That is the ring underneath the bezel. You can see the bezel has the Maltese cross cut, and then you have that ring underneath it that was not on the second generation watch. It gives a little bit more body and volume to the watch, causes it to read as a larger timepiece without actually making it so. Sunburst dial, you can really see that to good effect from this angle, as well as the depth of the dial and the height of the indices. Jumping right back into the box, Watch Aficionado is joining us. Blue Shirt Buddha in the box, Eric Nielsen. Tim, did you talk to the guy 
who asked to get his own custom Damasco DC-80 chrono with left-hand drive. Uh, no, I, did I see the guy, you ask? No, no, I haven't seen it, but if Damasco does that, very cool. And right here, Freddie Turner saying, I've been tempted by the VC Overseas. He says it is the best dial combo, the Overseas Zurich. Now let's talk about a chronograph that's actually my favorite Tag Heuer of all time. This is an interesting watch with a storied history, and I say that because the history has a story. Previewed in 2011, ostensibly for sale exclusively at McLaren dealers, not Tag Heuer dealers, McLaren car dealers, only brought to market in 2014 through dealers, McLaren dealers. This is the Tag Heuer Carrera McLaren MP412C, named after McLaren's first modern era post F1 road car. Now the timepiece is 43 millimeters in titanium with Carrera lugs and a blasted finish. You could see that the chronograph pushers have the form of automotive pistons with the slots for the piston rings. You could see that the crown features a rubber surround or inlay with the McLaren logo outboard. The design was actually created in consultation with McLaren in walking, and the dial features a combination of carbon fiber and smoked sapphire at center. It is both a flyback chronograph and an annual calendar made in only a thousand pieces with an original retail of a frankly insane $14,000. This is one to buy pre-owned. You can see the same font used on the tachometer, or tachometer I should say, of the McLaren dashboard, with the zero that represents the digital speedometer. You can see at center there is a small aperture down at about 430. That is a five. That's the month of the year. Five for May. 11, a double digit date. So you have the date and you have the month. It's an annual calendar. It's also a flyback chronograph. 100 meters water resistant. You can swim with it, though it is a motorsports inspired chrono. You can see the McLaren logo on the tack. And you could see 330, the speed in kilometers per hour that the MP412C can attain. McLaren actually under-promised and over-delivered. The car's been clocked at 352. But this was the intended top speed. Turn it all over, and what surprised me here is that Tag Heuer opted for what is at minimum a top-grade ETA 2892A2 base. It might be a chronometer because it's a chronometer style balance with a Nevorox 1 hairspring. Very impressive. By the way, the Dubois de Praz annual calendar flyback chronograph module on this watch, the 4900, is the same featured on the McLaren RM1103 by Richard Mille. So you can get your McLaren watch with the annual calendar chronograph from the same Dubois de Praz manufacturer for a hell of a lot less money by just buying this. And that's my favorite modern era Tag Heuer. Jumping in the box, we got a lot of friends. We're up to 225. Guys, stay with me. Build this thing. Uh, we have bump, 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 Eric Nielsen saying for the McLaren car buyer, that sticker price is a shrug. Pre-owned, it's even more of a shrug. And I can see right here, bump, 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 Tim Masso sunglasses. Is that a ladies movement or is the case that big? A 2892 is, I want to say 25.6 millimeters in diameter. It's a small automatic, but it's a great one. And right here we've got bump, 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 what kind of watch did Ayrton Senna wear? I have no idea. That's a great question, but it might be lost to history. And Edward Ledden saying, I don't know, maybe Richard Mille did better McLaren watches. And for only 10 to 20 times the price, I can't disagree. That said, for value, I wouldn't bet against the Tag Heuer. I would actually go with the Tag. Speaking of interesting watches, we've got a lot on the table tonight. Let's talk about a brand that's sometimes framed as an independent, certainly the flagship manufacturer of Japan, Grand Seiko, this year launching a set of Elegance manual wind watches in 39 millimeter cases. This is the Iwate dial featuring a splayed reflective galvanized blue dial with a pattern and a tone that can be seen at certain times of the day on the peak of Mount Iwate outside of the Shizuku Ishii luxury manufacturer of Grand Seiko in northern Japan. The watch features exceptional dial detail. The minute hand and the power reserve hand bent manually to trace the domed arc of the dial base, with a domed sapphire designed to evoke mid-century 1960-1970 Grand Seiko dress watches. The dial absolutely explosive. It has the pattern of the Arushi series from this year from the same class of watches, the Elegance series, but this is a galvanized dial, not Arushi. Three-day power reserve manual 
manual wind. This is the first new manual wind Grand Seiko Caliber 9S63 in eight years. Three-day power reserve manual wind adjusted to six positions, not the chronometer standard of five, with guaranteed precision of minus three plus five, not the chronometer standard of minus four plus six. A lovely piece, just over 11 millimeters thick with huge personality. I adore this watch, and it's nice and compact across the wrist, so just about any wrist down to 13 centimeters circumference can wear this one with grace. Jumping into the box, we've got friends, Tim Masso Sunglasses, commenting, I love Grand Seiko, and uh, Jakob Kasper saying, I had the pleasure of visiting Grand Seiko in Morioka, northern Japan in 2016. The level of craftsmanship blew my mind. And I can see Justin Hill, beautiful and elegant, blue shirt Buddha, must be your favorite color, correctly noting that that is one hell of a striking dial. Let's talk about a small independent. Not from Germany, not from Switzerland, not from Japan. Where could it be? How about Volkermarkt Austria? Habring, the namesake brand of Richard and Maria Habring. They run a very small ship out of Austria. Almost all of this watch, the Doppel 3, being made in Austria. A GPHG Laureate from 2013. This is a phenomenally decorated timepiece with a 42 millimeter stainless steel case and a sector style dial with multiple finishes. You can see circular concentric brushing. You can see vertical satin finish across the center. You can see snailing on the oversized sub-registers. Richard Hobring was the man who invented the original IWC Doppel Chrono. This is his man manufacture A08 movement, an improvement on the original IWC, so he's actually improving on his own original design. In-house caliber, in-house complication, a beautiful presence on the wrist at 42 millimeters, a perfect size, a lovely semi-mono pusher Rattrapont. It features two triggers rather than the standard Rattrapont 3, and a glorious piece from a brand that makes only a few dozen watches a year. So this is real boutique watchmaking. Once you own one of these, you're basically part of the family. They will personally respond to your emails. The Hobring Doppel 3, an absolute blinder of a watch with a glorious grayscale dial featuring a shock of red and blue. I love it. Bump, bump, bump. Oh, I can see Ball is joining us, Ball Y. And we've got Sean Puffy Catacombs. And Eric Cecil in the box, Matt Foster saying, like Hobring, would be a great weekend watch. The lugs on that one are very strong. Abdul noting Hobring are very hard to come by. They are of the highest quality. Very true. Let's jump to... Here's a big brand. This is the definition of a big brand. We've got Rolex. The Rolex Oyster Perpetual Datejust 16220. This is a watch that has a salmon metallic sunburst dial. This is a U serial number from 1997. Look closely, it's not a white gold bezel. This is the steel engine turned bezel. Far less common. The watch is an incredible survivor. Look at the condition of the break between the case flank and the satin finished hoods. Look at it on both sides, how sharp that break is, how even the metal is from side to side, how full the lugs remain. This one has hardly, if ever, been refinished. It is an extraordinary dial with white gold Roman numerals and that salmon metallic 36 millimeters on a Jubilee bracelet with a Z serial that also corresponds to 1997. It is original to the watch and you can see it too features all of its original metal with the crown on the clasp having wonderful depth and definition not having been refinished. A lovely piece and a little giant. By the way, this watch is so fresh. Not only is the case back sticker still intact, you can still see if you hold it at the right angle to the light, you can still see the Jubilee pattern with the interlocking Rolex Rolex across the sticker and the reference number of the watch. An incredible museum piece. No, a time capsule piece. And I only say that when I mean it. All right, let's bring down the curtain on this episode with a couple of weird watches. Bell & Ross, launched in 2012. This is the 25-piece platinum power reserve jumping hour WW1 Eur Sautant. It is a wandering hour complication with a complication designed for Bell & Ross by Vincent Calabrese. This is about as exotic as it gets with a bi-directional jump hour. You'll never see one of those. Wire style lugs, platinum case, ETA 2892 base in chronometer spec. 
100 meters water resistant despite obviously being a dress watch. The timepiece is absolutely bizarre, weird, and wonderful. You will not see another Bell & Ross like this because they only made 25 of them. With an original retail of $39,000 and a pre-owned price somewhere around 10, this is the ultimate conquest for a guy who wants what's effectively a piece unique. You'll never encounter another. Jumping into the high horology sphere, an independent horology, Laurent Ferrier, launching the Galet Traveler to great acclaim. This is a version with a cloisonné enamel dial of the Atlantic sphere. You have Africa, Europe, North, South America, and the Greenland landmass. Note that they have used wires in gold to create the cloisonné effect, the constraining of the enamel paint, the vitreous paint. That creates the definition. Now shading the color, creating different thickness, creates the shades that you see around the continental shelf, the different shading of the oceans, as well as the landmass. You can see all white gold applique indices, white gold hands, and outboard a brushed concentric graining. The second time zone is at 9 o'clock. The date is over at 3 o'clock. You have a travel time function that allows you to jump the hour hand. 40 millimeters, this watch is absolutely extraordinary in white gold. Turn it all over. This is caliber FBN 230. Micro rotor automatic three-day power reserve double direct impulse escapement with finish in the grandest tradition of Geneva. Black polish, five interior angles, black polished screw heads with chamfered slots. This is a gorgeous piece, front or back, a work of art in the grandest tradition of traditional Swiss horology. As I like to say, Laurent Ferrier, a new manufacturer, old standards. And now I finish with a watch I cannot top. Made in 2002 in 247 copies for the 247th anniversary of Vacheron Constantin. This is the Platinum 37mm retrograde day date. An exquisite timepiece with a freehand engraved ratchet wheel for the jumping system. A black polished ratchet pawl for the jumper. A brilliant pusher adjuster system on the flank that frees you from using a pencil or a pen to try to set your calendar, you can actually adjust the entire system, which is gloriously hand finished and visible, and get instant gratification with the retrograde. On the case back, adjust in a, adjusted in a chronometer like five positions, caliber 1126, a Gégère Lecoultre 889 on the front, Vacheron's own manufacturer retrograde date eight module. As good as it gets, you don't see straight graining, anglage, freehand engraving and black polish on a dial side with Cote de Genève all that often. But on this watch, you never have to take it off. Boom, guys who joined me, thank you so much. You made this a wonderfully successful episode. If you're just joining late, click link in the description, please enter to win that Milgos. International eligibility, our first time ever. And of course, join me at Tim underscore Masso on Instagram, where I continue to post videos after the lights dim in the studio. Thanks to you, thanks to my crew, time out, Tim out, and thanks for logging on. Mm -hmm.